Welcome everyone. On behalf of Perfection Learning, I am so excited to have everyone joining us for tonight's webinar on balancing skill and content in AP World History. It is my pleasure to introduce our expert and teacher for this evening, Dave Drazonic. Dave comes to us with over 20 years of teaching and the last 16 of which he has been teaching AP World History. In addition to his time in the classroom, Dave has an extensive resume in the AP world. He has been an AP grader for the world history exam, presented at AP conferences, and wrote and delivered the content for the AP world history online video series and national exam prep site, get a five. Our personal favorite credential of Dave's is that he has been incredibly involved with our AP world history modern course book by AMSCO over the years as a senior reviewer and question writer for multiple editions of the text. He's also a regular contributor to our Next Step blog. Dave, thank you so much for being here tonight to share your knowledge. Throughout the webinar, please put any questions you have in the chat as well as the Q&A. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to you, Dave. Hi, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, I'm coming in from you from uh, cold uh, Chicago, uh, Illinois, but I'm excited to spend an hour with you guys. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, kind of giving you advice that I got from somebody um, back, back in the day when, uh, when you signed up for a, um, an, a learning experience or a teacher workshop. Um, someone told me once that if you can take one nugget of information from it that you're going to use for the rest of your teaching career, it's worth it. So my, my goal today is to teach you guys or, or share with you guys plenty of things and maybe allow you to have one or two or three or a couple nuggets that you're going to use um, and be able to use for the rest of your uh, teaching career. Um, some of you guys might be new teachers uh, to AP World History. Some of you guys might be veterans. Um, and again, the goal today is to kind of Make sure that we uh, we look back at uh, AP World History. We'll look at what we've done in the semester, but um, look at what we can do in the, the second semester and refresh a little bit. Um, and again, I hope I, I, I'm able to provide you guys uh, with some guidance on how to balance the skills and the content that this course uh, desires and 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 seeks and, and needs. Right. So um, with that said, um, one of the things I want to uh, share with you guys, I'm going to share my screen. And I am going to start off by um, talking to you guys um, about um, some of the tips I, that I think that I've put together uh, that teachers need to be successful in AP courses in general, but especially in AP World History. Now, I wrote a blog on this um, for Perfection Learning. Um, so the, the, there's a blog that um, you can go to. Um, I think a link will be sent to you guys that you guys be able to see these blog posts. But I just wanted to start off by uh, talking about a couple of them. Um, I wrote about eight successful tips. Uh, and, and one of the things um, I think that is the most important thing in teaching AP is establishly, establishing what I call like a cult. Um, and, and this is in terms of, of teaching, right? I think this is the most important thing. Um, I, my, my son the other day uh, came home and he was doing some math homework. And uh, one of the things he had said is he, you know, I, I'd asked him, um, are you asking questions on that? And he said, dad, I'm afraid to ask questions. And I would say, if you have set up a, um, a, a classroom that kids are afraid to maybe ask questions, um, then that's, that's where uh, one change has to occur, right? We have to, we have to make sure that we set up a, a classroom where kids um, are uh, not afraid to ask questions. You want them to ask questions. You should, you should demand um, that your students ask you questions, right? I always tell my students like, demand more of me, challenge me, put me on the spot, ask me as much as you can, because I have things in my head that I wanna get in your head. And the, the, only, one, the only way we can do that is by, uh, is by you guys seeking that and asking questions. So one of the most important things I think is setting up a cult of, uh, and, and with that it's um, you know, just understanding that you trust each other, but you are going to laugh when you, you need to laugh. Um, you're going to do crazy things like maybe make t-shirts at the end of the year. Um, but it's about building a program and not just like uh, one individual class. Um, as I go through really quickly, I'm not going to hit on all of these because there's a lot I want to do today, but um, knowing when to push and pull in the class, I think is so very, very important. And uh, what that means is, is knowing when to push ahead two or three steps and knowing when kids are like a deer in the headlights and knowing when to pull back. And I'm going to talk about that in one of the first things that I'm going to do today. Um, and speaking of that, one of the first things I'm going to tell you guys in the key to balancing skills 
and content in AP World History and really in any AP, AP course is you have to make a schedule and you have to stick to it. I was presenting at a conference one time in Westmont, Illinois, and I had a teacher ask me, um, you know, uh, they raised, raised her hand and she had said, am I in trouble? And I was presenting in late March. And she said, am I in trouble if um, I'm still on the Middle Ages? And I didn't know how to answer the question without saying, I said, yes, ma'am, you are, right? Um, and that's something that you can address next year. Um, because if you are still teaching in the 1450s or 1350 to 1450 and, and you're there at March, then your kids are at a disservice. And the way, to, the way to make sure that that doesn't happen is to make a schedule over the summer, make a schedule, readjust, look at where you're at, but make a schedule from start to finish. And I'll tell you how to do that. That's one of the things that we're going to spend some time on today um, and building in skill days and building in content days and assessment days. Um, and I have some other things on the blog um, about holding standards high, adjusting points. It depends on who you grade. I, um, and I'm gonna tell you about my program. I have 265 freshmen this year taking AP World History. So I have to be able to adjust points so their grades aren't looking at them scary and they're all sitting there like, oh my gosh, I wanna drop the course. But my, my standards stay high. I grade with the AP rubrics. I keep the standards high and then I can adjust their points to, to make sure that it's, it's fair. Um, and that's something that I would suggest as well. Um, again, I have more detail on this um, and everything that we have uh, today, we're gonna be able to package it and send it to you guys. Um, and uh, you'll be able to have these, we're gonna go through some lessons, we're gonna go through some calendars um, and all this stuff we'll be able to send your way. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I just wanted to mention now before I, I dive into the, the first uh, segment is, um, is understanding the content of this course. And one of the keys to being able to do that is to read as much as you can from the college board. So obviously the college board has um, the curriculum guide that kind of guides you in terms of what content to cover, um, but take as many college board exams as you can so that you start understanding what is going to be asked on the, on the tests. Um, the biggest thing that I ever had in, in my history teaching this course, um, we had started a long time ago. Um, the, the course came in, it can, came into being in 2002. And um, about 2005 or 2006, we started taking kids out of AP, or uh, excuse me, Honors World History and taking them one day a month at night and one week, uh, one morning in, in a, a week and teaching them extra stuff they needed to do to, to be able to take an AP World History exam. And we found out the kids were successful and the program started to grow. It became a class in 2008 and it started with 30 and then went to 60 and then 90. And again, we have 265 freshmen taking AP World History at our school, in my school at Carl Sandburg High School. And we're really, really proud of that. But one of the things that I, I, I just became a, a student of is the, the AP released exams. Um, going all the way back to 2002, and you guys know that we've been teaching it for a while, the course has gone through several changes. Um, you know, from trivia, multiple choice questions to uh, stimulus-based questions. Um, but getting and taking those tests, I, I almost, for me, it's like, a, it's, it's the best when the college board releases an exam, not only because you have more questions for the following year, but because you get to take the test and uh, taking them and, and learning again, what is stressed. And by doing that, that's going to help you with one of the keys uh, to this, you know, my, my speech today is, is understanding what content to teach. Um, and by taking these uh, released exams and looking at them holistically, you start realizing what the college board really stresses. You start understanding the kids are going to be asked things about the industrial revolution. You're going to understand Meiji restoration jumps out at you as a, as a big deal, right? The opium war, knowing the opium war and its effect on China. These are, these are things that you get when you start taking these practice exams and realizing there are some examples that I can teach my students that get made more bang for their buck, right? That these are these are examples that I'm I'm going to be able to use, and I'm going to be able to use them in multiple ways. For example, like the Haitian Revolution, you know, realizing that um, in the Haitian Revolution you can use it for social change, political change. Um, so you get this by being able to take um, and be able to take these released exams and start understanding what the College Board wants you to know. Um, Next, you know, just looking at, this is a, a little hint that I'm going to end uh, today with, is the single greatest thing you can do, I think, as a teacher to prepare for the AP test is build in a month of, a, of review at the end of the year. So you have to finish your course and finish it with about a month before the AP test. 
So um, April 12th, have everything finished by so that you're reviewing for a month and build in a full, if you can, um, build in it, build in a full timed simulated practice exam. And it's the, the, the single most important thing I think you can do. Um, if you're looking at this year, trying to be successful and in future years, making sure that you try to build it in. Um, this has taken a, a while for us, um, at our school. Um, our administration is very, uh, is, is great. They work with us. They actually allow us to come in on a Sunday, um, and set it up and uh, set, have tables and do everything like the, the AP uh, college board exam will be on like May 12th. And um, it is the single greatest thing we, we can, that you can do um, for uh, getting your kids ready for the test. Um, I read a book one time um, and I actually saw a speaker and uh, she had uh, written the book and the book was called Choke. And she talked about how she worked with Olympic athletes and the greatest single thing that an Olympic athlete could do and she worked with swimmers and figuring out why they choke um, is you have to be able to put yourself in a situation before you do it. And considering we work with 265 freshmen, getting them to be in a simulated exam um, three weeks before the actual real exam um, is the single greatest thing that you can do uh, for your students. Um, you do have to grade it. You have, <laughs> it takes a while. I have about a thousand cups of coffee. Um, it takes me about a week and a half to grade all the essays and the multiple choice and come out with the, uh, the math equation that is a one, two, three, four, or five, but it's the single greatest thing that, that you can do. I'll do more on that later. Once again, um, just finishing this off, I think at some point you should be an AP grader. You learn how to grade efficiently, quickly. You learn what the, the college board looks for and helps you and to use the college board tools that they provide you. Okay. Um, so a little bit about myself uh, and the program. Again, I told you we have 265 freshmen that take AP World History. Um, one of the, uh, you know, we had, we had, I think, two or three years ago, obviously before COVID, um, our principal wanted to check that. And she had said unofficially that was the largest group of freshmen that were taking an AP test um, in the nation, which we and our school was uh, very and is very, very proud of. Now, one of the things I would suggest you do um, in, in, ordering, in, in order to learn how to balance um, skills and content is, and, and I had mentioned this before, but one of the first things I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about this and spend a little bit of time on this, is establish um, a calendar. Um, this, is, this is this year's, um, in my 2021-22 AP World History calendar. Um, this will be shared for you. Um, you guys will be able to look at this and have this. Um, and this is basically what I do every single day. Um, as you can see, we started school um, in August. And I do, I, I take the first maybe about six or seven days of, of school. And I get them used to doing some AP type stuff. Um, the first, I, I guess some people call it a toolbox unit. This is the funnest uh, part of the year. I get kids in. Um, we do some uh, neat things about cultural diffusion games, um, and, I, and I'll talk about that when I move into lessons. Um, and then we start um, teaching them some of the skills that they need to do. Um, but as I'm, as I'm going through this, I want to get to something that's uh, really, really important. One of the things that we have built in in our program, and I, and I guess talking about my program, um, I, I do want to tell you that we use um, the AMSCO World History Book. Um, uh, I was able to, you know, do some writing for them and do some, um, you know, uh, do some questions and things like that. But the reason why I think this is such a good textbook um, is, is that we deal with freshmen and we have used all types of different textbooks. And we found out that as our program has grown to 265 freshmen, um, we wanted a textbook that kids will stick to. They will read when we give them um, chapters to read um, that they will read them. And sometimes if you go with a bigger textbook, um, sometimes uh, uh, I would say probably a week or two or three weeks into reading, kids trail off and they just maybe stop reading if the reading gets too much. What I love about the AMSCO textbook is that it's broken up and it aligns with the, the curriculum guide that you get from the college board, but the readings are doable. Um, we give the kids, we tell the kids that since we have freshmen, um, we tell them it works out to us anywhere between 12 and 18 pages a week. Um, they buy the textbook for, for us, they annotate it, um, they, they, it's their book, so they get to draw all over it and annotate it and engage with the textbook. But one thing that we do is we have built in the schedule and it works with freshmen that 
I would suggest you guys try if you haven't yet. And what that is and what that means is having a weekly schedule that is um, predictable. For example, when we start, we start, and if you guys can see as a calendar, we start quizzing and we have quizzes every Friday. So when the quizzes start, um, the AMSCO reading quizzes, we have a quiz, a reading quiz every single Friday. And I'll show you what a sample quiz looks like, um, but our normal week um, goes as, as, as following. What we usually do is we start in Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday become our skills days. So if you look at this, we, this, uh, this week on a calendar, um, this was in September, and this was um, a trade week, right? So that we were we were learning about the Silk Road, the Indian Ocean, and the uh, Trans-Saharan um, trade route. So Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, these are my skill days. They are days where I can do primary source investigations. I can practice writing. I can do trade simulations. Um, those are my skill days. So when balancing content and skill, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, every single week in the AP year are my skill days. That is where I do exit slips. I practice writing. We practice thesis statements. I'm going to show you some um, the, the second the second phase of this uh, this this lecture series or this webinar is going to be creative lessons that you can do to teach this. So um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday are my skill days. Um, Thursday is my content day. That is my big picture or lecture day. So I, I lecture one day a week. Now I love it. I love lecturing. Um, I love spicing it up with outside stories. I like, um, I like everything there is about lecturing. I know it sounds goofy, but, um, Thursday is my big picture day, my content day. Now I tell the kids, there is no way that I can give you all the information you possibly need to be ready for a, a quiz on Friday. So you have to read. That's our one agreement. And by the way, one of the things that um, we have worked on in the class is no busy work. So one of the things that we make an agreement, I actually shake all the kids' hands, I look them in the eye and I said, your job is to read one chapter or read the reading, reading for the week. Again, it works out for to about 12 to 18 pages a week. So as you guys can see, you know, four pages here, five pages here, four pages here. That's the weekly reading. Okay, so what that works out to what? Um, four plus five, that's nine plus four, that's 13 pages this week. And that's their, their goal. They have to read those 13 pages. On Thursday, okay, um, that's my big picture. I connect the dots, I show them, and I highlight the important information, the must know content, some significant dates, but it's a big picture. I tell them that's my 30,000 foot view, is that I'm flying over or you know, looking at it this way. That is the view of the forest. You know, um, sometimes we need to get in the forest and look at all the details, but on Thursday, it's my big picture. Um, and then Friday, they take a quiz. Now, some people don't necessarily like to uh, lecture before the quiz, and that's fine too. I know some people that have a quiz on Thursday, and then Friday, they think their lectures and discussions are more enriching, more engaging, because the kids have already prepared for the quiz for that. Some people follow up the following Monday with a, a lecture. Um, there's any way that you can do it. But for me and for my class, freshmen and sophomores, I, I love this. And at the end of the year, the kids always give me some feedback and they, they basically say that um, they love the lectures before just because it connects the dots and helps them understand. And then Friday is assessment day. So you can say there's, there's we always have quizzes, always have reading quizzes. And I'll tell you about sometimes that you want to substitute a, maybe an essay if you need to work that day as a quiz day on an assessment day on Friday or a normal, as I call it, an AMSCO quiz um, on Friday. But Thursday is my content day. It's driven by content. It's, it's big picture. And then Friday is assessment day. Okay. So if I go back to um, and start looking at, again, um, what takes place on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, this is where you want to build in the skills that kids are going to need for the course. Now, I would suggest, and the way the course is built, um, is to make sure that um, you, you focus on it, whatever skill you're working on, they build on each other. So one of the things that we first start with, we start with getting kids ready for those multiple choice quizzes, the stimulus questions. And that, that comes with learning how to read a primary source, um, learning how to read secondary sources. So there are, you know, several, um, you know, days built in where kids are learning how to do those things. And then you just have to give them multiple practices, okay? And so our weekly quiz, I'm going to share something with you really quickly, is our weekly content quiz 
um, would look something like this. Like for instance, um, we, we, we use a quiz like this. Um, you know, this is something that the kids are getting ready for actually to, uh, uh, tomorrow's Thursday, we're gonna lecture on it and Friday, this quiz is already done. So our quizzes look something like this. We will put reading questions in. So, you know, we are working, we are already on 5.7 to 5.10. And that's going to be our last chapter for uh, this semester. And then we're going to start with unit six when we come back in January. But we have reading questions worked in here. So there's several reading questions on the Tanzanet reforms on this one, the self-strengthening movement, the Meiji re restoration or reformation. We got some questions about Karl Marx and Frederick Engel. And then we, we always put in a total of about, I would say about eight to nine stimulus questions. So you can see there's a question here. Um, there's a couple stimulus questions on the Communist Manifesto. We got a, a poster here. We got a chart here. So it, it works out to about on a 30 question quiz on Fridays. Um, about nine of those, they're always going to be stimulus. And that way, um, we let the kids, you know, get exposed to those stimulus questions um, that are pertinent or are specific to that week of reading. And um, we just expose them to a lot of multiple choice stimulus questions. Um, and then there's reading questions as well, but that's what like a Friday quiz looks like. If I go back to kind of my schedule and what we have here is again, um, being able to schedule these in. So if you look at, you know, as we're, we're going through, and again, this will be shared with you guys. Um, you can see where I'm going to get to where we are this week, right? So you can see right here, um, the kids did an industrial revolution web quest is one of their skill days. We got SAQ practice today. Um, a lecture, which is going to be tomorrow on 5, 7 to 5, 10. And then it's going to be um, an AMSCO quiz, like the quiz I just showed you. Um, so those are those, this is how you kind of set it up. Now, with, with that said, um, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday days, that's what makes the class uh, so enjoyable. Um, being able to teach them the skills. This course took a fundamental change a couple of years ago. Um, you almost were able to predict multiple choice questions um, that were going to pop up on the, uh, the AP test. But when they went to stimulus questions, it became all about the skills of the course. And those AP questions um, and that those AP skills become so important to teach. So that's why building in those days that every day you're working on them, it's pretty significant. For instance, in this week in November, okay, we're actually... Uh, December 1st uh, on last Wednesday. Um, I love um, working on like and doing like mini debates. I am constantly in search right now in my stage of my career of doing lessons that are um, e extremely analytical. Um, lessons that get the kids to answer the question why, to get them to think, to get them to contradict, find contradictions. And so I, I if, if you have a day or um, you know, you, you, you want to get the kids to kind of, uh, you know, just have a, have a discussion, um, as I love two on two mini debates. So I'll set the desks up where it's two on two facing each other. The kids will sit down in the desk. I'll uh, flip a coin of deciding what side is a, and what side is B. Um, they will get a question. Um, and it could be any question. It could be a question about, um, uh, trade routes, you know, which trade route, um, had the most economic effects, um, in history, the Silk Road or the Trans-Saharan. Um, or cultural, which one, uh, which one was more influential in spreading non-goods? Um, you know, some, any questions that pop up like that and getting the kids, give them two minutes to prepare. And then there's an A side and a B side, and then there's an A1 and an A2 and a B1 and a B2. And the kids get uh, one minute to kind of go uh, with an opening argument. And then the, the second person in that group works on contradictions. And then other teams have to nominate um, different, you know, the, basically after the, after the class is having, you're just kind of walking around listening to these, um, these, these lessons or these debates. Um, you, you, you might hear something that's neat and then they nominate a kid, someone from an opposing team nominates somebody that they thought was a good argument. And they'll come up and they'll debate in front of the class. Um, but any lessons that, 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 um, you are searching for um, and gets the kids to search for and dig deeper on questions of why or analysis are so important. Um, all right. So again, um, this is, this is the schedule. This will be shared with you guys um, looking at like when we come back in, in, in January, if you're this, this stage in the, in your uh, semester and you're like, okay, um, what am I going to do next semester? Um, 
you know, we, we kind of fill that same uh, program, right? Every Friday is going to be some type of an assessment. Um, one of the things that I'm going to share with you guys lessons here in a second, but one of the things I, I like you guys to, to look at is that I think it's really important to take a full week, um, four times a year and build it into your schedule um, so that you have an exam, uh, an exam week, right? So the reason for doing this is that you're able to refresh and, uh, and basically um, review um, all the things that you have done on a week basis. So usually maybe four weeks at a time, five weeks or six weeks might every six weeks might be a unit test. Um, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to um, work on any skills that you think are deficient. Um, so if you can see this week, um, we're going to do a little activity that's going to get the kids to, to know some of the figures that we've talked about. It's going to also uh, get the kids to working on um, point of view. Um, but then on Wednesday, we're going to do practice sample questions, learning how to answer the stimulus questions, working on contextualization. And then this is just connecting the dots, big picture. Again, that Thursday lecture, and then Friday, they take a unit exam. Um, we always have retests as well. So we'll come back from a unit exam and kids will come back the following week and they will retest um, and they have an initial score. So usually a good score on a unit exam is about 65%. And so their goal is to try to get that 65%. And then they're able to retake the test. They're able to come in with a partner or two groups of three or two, and they're able to come in after school, before school or evening. We'll set that whole next week up where the kids can come in and they can um, go over, bring everything except, and they can't have their phones, they can't have computers, but they can use their review books, their textbooks, their notes, and they sit and they work on these questions together to retake it again. I tell them their initial score, but I do not tell them which questions they got right or wrong. And they go back and they revisit these questions and they really try to, and they're motivated to get as many as they can right but they spend time going and dissecting a question. And that's one of the things that we work on, right? Is the skill of being able to learn how to answer these stimulus questions. So um, again, one of, the, one of the things looking at, again, is um, just making sure that you build in time um, for these types of uh, uh, discussions to happen. Um, again, uh, looking at real quick, um, some of the things that I am going to stress. Um, so one of the, one of the things, again, if, if I stress this and moving away from the calendar is um, being able to make sure at the beginning of the year that you've plotted out the entire schedule. If I go through all the way to the end, you'll realize that it has everything marked from the ending date, which is the AP test and working backwards. And this way I am able to know that I have covered everything in this class and I am in the first week of April, I am ready to review. If you guys notice on this, is unit exam, 1900 to present. And so that is the last exam that I'll have. And then from April 11th on, it's all review. Um, and this is, this is what I um, have used in terms of, of reviewing um, the days that I break down with the skill practice. But um, one, once again, the most important thing that I would suggest is making sure that you have a month to review and then breaking down um, you know, day by day uh, the skills that you wanna teach the kids. Um, all right, the next thing I wanna go to is talking to you guys about some, some of these creative lessons um, that would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, that, uh, I'm sorry, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday that, that would appear on, on the schedule. So um, one of the things that, that I think is important is realizing that you gotta, you gotta have some lessons that are fun, that's that two step forward, one step back. So one of the things that you know, I'm gonna share with you guys are some of the lessons that I use throughout the year. Now, they, they come in like levels. Um, realizing that some, um, some lessons are designed for fun. Um, for instance, uh, a Louis, like in this one, I have a murder mystery, um, a fictitious murder. I knew Louis the 16th was guillotine, but I, I put a whole uh, thing on. I come in and uh, I, I'm a detective and I say that there was poison in Louis's blood um, and we have to find who the murderer is. And I give them a list of people that attended a party. Uh, time is irrelevant in this and the kids have to um, brainstorm on what they know. Um, these, this is usually a review for a unit. So they know these people, they can look up any other people. They get about five minutes to do some uh, quick deep dive on these individuals. And then what I do is um, they can have no phones or no electronics. And I start reading off clues and I have this all on a PowerPoint. 
and I'll throw up a clue. The cause of the death was ink poisoning. So the clue is ink here. Um, and you can see in this one, I, this is a murder mystery. I have many versions of this. Uh, so each class gets a different one, um, but it, 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 um, it moves to you're looking for a writer after the clue. Um, I have an anagram on here. What's an anagram kids usually have, but these are fun little um, clues and days that get the kids thinking about some of the important figures of AP world history and then doing it in a fun way. So that's one lesson I like to do that's it's strictly kind of just a, a fun thing. I have a scoring system on this where the kids take guesses the first round, second round, third round, fourth round, fifth round, and then I get a winning team. So usually it's, it's they have a partner. And what I will do is I'll, as a prize, I'll have the, par the parents call in, uh, mom or dad call in on Zoom during one of my lectures on Thursday and say, hey, I heard you won the murder mystery, congratulations. Um, you know, I tell them that they'll get a significant reward and the significant reward is, uh, is a mom or dad calling it. Um, so you need to do lessons like this and these that are fun, that are engaging as part of that building that cult. Um, and this would be, a need, these lessons would be perfect for like shortened weeks um, if you're going into Thanksgiving and you get, you know, we had Monday and Tuesday, but we were off on Wednesday. So I did the murder mystery that week um, and it was perfect. It was a good review. It was fun. It was engaging. And you need to make sure that you're not pressing forward all the time. That's one of the, the best things about teaching AP is that you're with the kids. You're in it together. You're doing everything. Their success is your success. You want everyone to learn. Um, but one of the things is you also can't always press all the time. And so these activities are fun. Now, um, there's, there's lessons like that um, that I think are, are super fun. Um, there's lessons that are maybe a little bit more thinking that leave a mark um, and leave some, like a lasting impression. So one of my favorites that, uh, that I did um, was I read an article one time about um, a guy from MIT and he ended up uh, having the students, uh, and, and basically he wanted to figure out, you know, these are the kipu, the ink, ink and kipu. And um, he, uh, he wanted to um, see if they could figure out what actually and how to actually the Incans use the Kipu and what, and if they could actually read it. So he got a whole bunch of like professors together and he sat them in a room and he said, okay, how would you use um, colored knots or colored string to convey thoughts and messages? We know they're like census, they're used for the census. The Incans didn't have a written language. They made use of these, these tied knots, but we can't read them today. So how, how do we read them? Let's hypothesize. So I, I, I was fascinated by the article. And so um, basically I cut string, uh, you know, on, on a day when I'm talking about the Incans in the first semester and I have the kids break up in groups and I say, all right, so we have to send a message to the next classroom. And it's about how we know it's census. So how many people are in this room? Um, what their age is? Um, I throw in there who's married because I'm married. We got to recognize that somehow. Um, and then we got to we got to put some other census information in and you have to brainstorm how you would do that with these colored ropes, these colored colored strings. And then we're going to see if somebody in another classroom can read it. And so I, that's just a fun lesson that I like doing. Um, and I'll send this along to you guys. It's super fun. It's neat. And then there was actually um, a guy recently. Um, he was a college kid um, from I believe it was Harvard. Um, and I think it's on here. Um, and, a, and a kid actually uh, made advances on learning the kipu um, to the point where they think they have it down of what they, what they, what the, the knots actually, the colored knots, where they're tied, what they actually mean. Um, but this is a, a fun little um, uh, lesson. Now, again, I'm giving you some examples of lessons um, that are, are fun. But one of the questions is this appears on the AP test about the ink and kipu. This is something that kids, every kid will get right after a lesson like this. Um, so it's something that has maybe multiple purposes. Um, another one that I love doing is uh, trade simulations. So um, there, are, um, there are some great trade simulations. This one is one of my all time favorites. This is not mine. This is something you can, you can actually um, Google um, Afro-Eurasian trade simulation, but this would, this would be like a perfect day when I showed you guys that week that we were doing Trans-Saharan, um, Indian Ocean and Silk Road. This is a perfect lesson um, for a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And the kids basically um, get a region, they trade, they can only trade with those regions. Um, and basically what ends up happening is, and I always post it on Twitter every, every year, is the group that gets Europe in this time period, 1200 to 1450 is kind of hosed. They can only trade with this middle region right here, the Byzantine Empire, and they're stuck. 
And during the course of the simulation, the kids see it and they recognize, oh my gosh, look at Europe. They're kind of isolated out there. Well, that lesson completely and totally transfers to AP World History where Europe is on the outside looking in. So again, these are, these are fun lessons, but um, they're, they're ways to make the, enhance the class a little bit so it's not dry all the time. But these are, um, these are neat, uh, neat ways to make, make sure the class is fun. Um, as we progress, there's going to be lessons that are working on skills as well. Um, so for, for example, um, this uh, is, I love this lesson. Um, I, I got this lesson maybe about 10 years ago and revamped it every year. Um, there used to be a, a lady um, that you used to send in $10 and she would give you a CD. You'd put a lesson in and you'd contribute a lesson and get like 50. And this came out of that somehow, but it's a, it's a great, great lesson. So when you're talking about the industrial revolution and imperialism, basically the kids in a nutshell, they, they pick an individual and they assume the identity of that person. They research the person and they have, they have to have an opinion on which category they're in. So they're either going to be in an industrial revolution summit or an imperialism summit. And they have to have their attitudes. They're, they're, they're going to come into class I give credit for props. I give credit for um, if the kids come in and they have mustaches and they have uh, clothing and the kids come in and they start learning point of view. And one of the things when you're talking about, um, you know, building a class is that one of the things that happen next after we do this is implementing like the document based questions and perspective and point of view. And so a lesson like this, um, kids take the persona of the person and they talk in that person, they talk about what that person's attitudes would be towards industrialization. There's a strict uh, series of questions they got to answer. And then um, the kids uh, create a headline story based on the summit. Um, so these are lessons that transfer um, and, and are skill-based lessons that would take, take place, excuse me, on like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or in the class. Um, Here's an example of the, uh, the, the mini lectures or mini, mini debates that we do, um, you know, who built a better empire, the Aztecs, Inca, Mali. Again, you can, you can create a whole bunch of questions and just, it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday lesson in trying to make sure that you're, you're teaching some type of skill that day. Um, you know, two things that just came to mind really quickly um, that I love doing is, um, again, uh, like if I have a primary source day, um, I'll, uh, I'll, you know, pull up some primary sources and we'll dig, dig into those and we'll actually, you know, figure out, you know, okay, what's going on with the person's writing this. So we have like primary source workshops. Um, but you need to have a day where you're actually doing stuff in class, um, where you're breaking it down with them. So like secondary sources, um, articles, um, I think it's Linda Schaefer who wrote Southernization. It's a wonderful article to use when you're talking about in the Indian Ocean, the influence of India early on in the year. Um, I love the comparison. There's an article um, uh, with Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo, and it looks at the perspectives of those two individuals. Now, Ibn Battuta sees everything through a religious lens, and Marco Polo sees everything that he's writing about through a merchant's lens. And this, again, builds on that skill of uh, perspective um, and getting the kids to understand that who you are affects what you see and what you write. Um, so these are, you know, these are uh, ways that you can incorporate Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, those skill days where you're constantly striving to build the skills of the course. Um, now, in terms of uh, skill like sequencing, um, what's really important is, I think, is understanding the direction and, and which way that you're going to, you know, teach the skills. Um, our program, again, is a 265 freshman. And just to give you a, a, a background on our program, it's grown. And um, we're probably with 260 fresh, 65 freshmen, everyone takes the exam. Um, so that's one of the things we want everyone to take the exam. We don't like necessarily cherry pick and say, oh, you can take the exam and you can't. Um, the greatest growth for a teacher is when every single kid in your class takes the exam. Um, and you get that feedback at the end of the year of how these kids do. And you're also realizing that when every kid is, is taking the exam, you're in it together. Um, you know, you're celebrating their successes. You're working on weaknesses. You're trying to make them strengths. You're enhancing those strengths. Um, so those are, uh, that I think that's important. And one of the things is um, we, we have, um, we're usually around an 85% pass rate with 265 freshmen. Last year was a goofy year with COVID. We tested 230 and we had about a 68% pass rate. And some of those students we didn't see actually in person the entire year. 
Um, they came in to take the test at the end of the year. That was the first time I was seeing some of these kids in person. Um, I said hello to them uh, rather than seeing them through a screen. So that number, even though that was down, um, that was still, we got 68% of 230 kids uh, to pass the AP exam freshmen. Um, and a lot of them we didn't even see. But on a normal year, about 85% pass rate of those 200. Again, this year we have 265 freshmen signed up for this course. They'll all take the exam and we'll probably, I'm fair to say, we'll probably be around 84% pass rate. And with that said, it can be done using the AMSCO World History textbook, right? That's what happens when you have the AMSCO textbook that kids will stick to and the kids will read. Um, so um, I do think that's a, you know, that, that's a, a, a good, I, I mean, it's not intentional. I, it's just, a, it's a plug for AMSCO. Um, I think it's uh, a really, uh, it's a textbook that kids will read. Um, and I think that's very important that kids will stick with it and stick to it because the length is not uh, so long. Um, and then you can enhance it with like your Monday primary source read. Or if you're reading about Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo, you can bring in that secondary source and dive into that as a group. Again, we tell the kids there's no busy work. You got to read that one chapter per week. We're going to quiz you on it on Fridays that those assessment days, we're going to talk about them on Thursdays. But everything we need to do in this course, every single thing we need to do, writing, um, you know, the, the LEQs, the DBQs, um, we can do in class. Now, speaking of writing, um, that is kind of the next phase that I want to go to. Um, and one of the things I think for writing is um, you have to scaffold them. Now, I'm going to come to writing here in a second, but I, I, I posed a, a question to myself, and I kind of want to answer that. Um, the way that we teach uh, skill um, at our school um, with 265 freshmen, again, we're teaching freshmen, is that we definitely hit the multiple choice first and we will work on that all year long. So every Friday they get a quiz and it has nine stimulus questions. And then every four or five weeks, um, the kids will take a unit exam test, which is all stimulus questions. And so they, and then they'll retake the, the unit test and they will just learn to break down those questions. And then after they retake the test, we go over them, we take one more day, um, or we have an extra like session. We, we have in my school, we have uh, something called period two where they build in an, an intervention um, and we'll take the test and we'll go over the correct answers. Um, and then when the kids see a question multiple times and they're able to, to you know, look at the question and break it down and start learning the tips on how to take those questions um, and take those, those multiple choice tests and they're just exposed to a ton of them, um, I think it helps. So the first thing, again, the first skill is that multiple choice test, the stimulus questions that we're constantly working on all year. And that comes with working on the reading of a textbook, working on reading primary sources in class and doing some of the skill stuff that we use to break down uh, secondary and primary sources. So that's our first skill that we tackle. Um, and that's of the four parts of the AP World History test, that's the first one. The second thing we, we tackle is we start learn, learning to write early in the year. So we do the LEQs next. So we, we, again, every Friday they're getting multiple choice tests, but then we, we start working in essay writing. Um, my class has written three full essays already this year. Um, so here we are on December 8th um, and they've written three essays. Um, I do have to say, I don't know, we call it a COVID year. I think teachers are working their butts off this year. Um, and I think we're doing a little bit more on finding that kids are still awesome. We have the greatest profession in the world. It's a great way to spend a lifetime. Um, but it's this year is we have to do a little bit more. We have to keep on working a little bit hard. We're almost teaching like time and a half, um, and skills with like times one and a half. Um, and so even in my essays right now, I can tell from years back from just doing it for so long that they need extra practice and then breaking that stuff down. So that's what I want to talk about now. So essay writing, I think, um, LEQs, I don't have a particular order, um, that, uh, that you should maybe teach the, um, the, the skills in, I like starting with comparison and then doing causation and then actually doing continuity and change over time because I find the continuity and change over time, it scores the lowest on the national average. Um, but I just like teaching the other ones first and then um, ending with that one. And that, that, that's actually my funnest one to, one to teach. So those, those three skills in essays, we write an essay each in the first semester. And how we do it, if I show you guys real quick, is um, we first start breaking things down. So for an example, um, we will use templates like crazy. So we'll have, you know, pose a question. So here's one from 1200 to 1450. 
And what we'll do is um, we'll put a question on the top and we will spend many, many days, like even just as, as a, a bell ringer really quickly, what does this question mean? So I'm gonna throw you a question real quick and the, in the beginning of the class, I'm gonna show you the, throw you this question. Could you answer it? Not necessarily could you write a whole essay on it, but could you, do you understand it? And could you answer it? Because that's what we're in the business and doing in AP World History. Um, I have uh, uh, a, a, a colleague I eat breakfast with every um, Wednesday for the last 17 years, and he was a teacher. Um, he's who, who inspired me to be a teacher. But one of the things he said, and I love it, is he said, in AP World History, you are here to learn how to think. And years from now, when you're doing like job interviews and stuff, and you're not going to learn, you know, you're not going to be asked about the Afro-Eurasian empires in a job interview, but you're going to know, you're going to have to learn how to think and think on your feet and think in an organized way. And that's what AP is. And so like in these questions, getting the kids to understand a question is super, super important. And then from there, getting the kids to brainstorm, take five minutes and pre-write the question and then learn how to organize that, right? And then organize it into three categories, three categories of investigation. So the first month of the year, um, the first two months of the year is getting the kids to understand the question, getting them to brainstorm some relevant history, and then what, whatever they brainstormed, seeing if they can learn to categorize. And that skill of categorizing could be just simply bringing in some baseball cards, throwing them in groups of two or three, putting the baseball cards on the, on the desks and having the kids learn how to categorize and say, okay, this is on, um, you know, guys with mustaches, or this is all uh, East Coast teams, or these are guys that hit um, over 300. Um, like stuff like that is what, how teachers have to be creative in scaffolding writing. So that'll be the type of stuff that I'll do for the first month, the first month and a half, the first two months of school. Um, but these templates come in handy, getting the kids to visually see that here's why I brainstormed some history. Here's where I start learning to categorize what the question means. If it's a similar question, I want two similarities and one difference. And then we start working into contextualization. And then we, we say, okay, what do your body paragraphs look like? Here's your topic sentence. And if you can stress topic sentences in this, in this course, right? You're going to be successful at writing because if you come up with two or three topic sentences, that's your thesis. Um, and getting the kids to see the, the structure of an essay is really important. So we use these um, these templates um, a ton. Um, you know, you can see uh, this is you know a change in continuity over time that we're working on with industrialization um, and getting the kids to do the exact same thing. So this is something that's uh, relevant um, from even like today. Um, so these. This, this is pretty important. Now, I'm on my third uh, essay, um, but let's say after the first essay, the kids write a full essay um, and you're going to get your classic mistakes. For me, freshman mistakes. So you're going to get, I have 90 students. So you're going to get maybe five, six, seven of them. They're going to write one long paragraph, right? And realizing that that's a correction, an easy correction. We want to have paragraphs. Um, but then I make notes, right? And I, I make notes and saying, okay, contextualization is extremely weak. And this is no different than um, like being a coach, right? Where you have a scrimmage and you realize, okay, we don't know the offense. We don't know the plays or our defense is terrible. And so then you have to break down what is weak into many lessons. So for an example, when, you know, the first essay was done after you teach contextualization, I'll come back and I'll say, all right, we were not good at contextualization. Hardly anybody got the contextualization point. So let's start again. Let's talk about what we know about contextualization. And you have to have lessons um, that you design that are pointed to achieve an objective, a very like, like simple objective, targeted objective. Like in this case, they, they're going to walk out of class on this day and they're going to understand contextualization. So um, again, uh, someone, I read this somewhere that someone says, hey, teach contextualization with Star Wars, the opening clip. So you roll it. And they see that, the, you know, the, the Star Wars screen come up and it's got very specific things in there, like Princess Leia and the Death Star and the plans have been stolen and there's a civil war going on. And you ask the kids, OK, can you watch the movie and enjoy the movie Star Wars without that intro? And the answer is yes. Just like you can have an essay without contextualization and it could be a good essay. But contextualization sets up that movie. It sets up your thesis statement. So we revisit this, right? We revisit what context should do. They look at their essays and they say if they've done something like that. And then we give little practice stuff, you know, contextualization. Why are these people, what do you have to understand here? Well, there's, it's, it's a great depression, right? What do you understand here? The COVID pandemic. What do you understand here? 
the backstory of Jackie Robinson, right? And breaking the, uh, the, the color barrier in baseball, right? And so then we, we revisit contextualization in their essays and then we'll practice. So we'll have things, for instance, like, you know, create a contextual statement, a statement for the following, right? And I'll show them the mosque, the great mosque located in Jenny Mali. Um, it's one of the finest examples of West African Islamic architecture. So what's the backstory? Tell me, why is there a mosque in West Africa? And a kid that can say, I think because of the Trans-Saharan, is an Islamic merchants had gone across the Sahara and there's bringing Islam to West Africa um, or you know, Ghana converted to, to Islam and then Mali converted. Um, these are the types of uh, discussions that you want to start having and kids start understanding what context is. And instead of just talking about context, they leave by, show, by you showing them several examples. And eventually they're going to say, aha, I think I can get it. You know, some more. Anchor Wat, why there's a Hindu and Buddhist temple in Southeast Asia, you know, Indian Ocean, getting the kids to understand the trade that went on there. Um, and then you just do these with all types of things, gunpowder empires. What's the backstory? What's relevant? What do we need to know? Some people can say, well, China developing gunpowder and it, and it diffusing throughout, you know, across the, maybe the Silk Road to other areas, or the Mongols aren't there anymore. Um, so it left the power void. So the gunpowder empires filled that. Any of that is context, but getting the kids to understand um, what paved the way for this to happen or what else is going on around this time period that's relevant to make, if you're writing an essay about gunpowder empires relevant. So these are just things that, um, that I'll do with the kids. Again, voyages, discoveries, what's the, what's the context? African slave trade, what's the context? Global flow of silver, what's the context, right? A cost of painting, what's the context? These are things that help the students learn how to break these skills down into manageable things. Um, going, going back, and let me just uh, kind of just say, the next skill that I would go into after I do the LAQs is the SAQs, and uh, I'm going to leave some, some time if we have any other um, questions here as, as we're going uh, 52 minutes in, um, but the next skill that I would teach is SAQs, and I find, and the reason why I find this is uh, pretty significant is that in, when you teach the LAQs and kids are writing full essays, when they get to the SAQs, they're ecstatic, and they're saying, wait, you just mean I have to answer the question and I do it anyhow, however I want to, and then use examples from history, that's easy. And that's what you want the kids to be able to do. If you in, in, introduce the SAQs first, um, you might have, uh, it might be flipped a little bit. They might have a harder time with the LEQs. So I think I like front loading and doing LEQ work first. Um, and then, uh, and then, and, and then hitting the SAQs after they've done LAQs, because I think it's easier. I think the kids are like, oh my gosh, these are my favorite. Um, SAQs are just bragging about what I know in history, and what I've learned. Um, and then SAQs, as you know, are still some of the skills that, that are asked in the multiple choice, right? There's a primary source, there's a secondary source, and then there's just history questions. So, um, that leads itself, I think a nice flow. And then here I am in December and I haven't taught a DBQ yet. So when I come back in the second semester, I will, um, I will definitely uh, start with the DBQs. As you, if you look back on my um, calendar here, if we look at that, and I will, second semester, I will come back and I will start right away intro, introing the DBQ. Um, and I usually pick a DBQ, a document that I'm teaching that week. So if I've already talked about imperialism, I'll start looking at a DBQ on imperialism. Um, so for example, um, there's a great DBQ that's an older one. It's about the African reactions to European imperialism. So what I love doing um, is a follow-up activity right here called a three doc thesis statement or a three doc practice. And I'll, it's very, very, very simple, um, but you can gain so much out of it. It's basically you can take any DBQ and you can cut them up and you can give a row or a group three documents and that's it. Um, you could just give them the whole DBQ and say, you have documents one, three, and five, you have two, four, and six, you have whatever you may, whatever you want to do. And basically the kids are just getting those three documents and they have to come up with an answer to the question with just the three documents that they're looking at. And so what, what you start seeing is kids start working together and breaking down a document, finding out what it means and pulling an argument from each document. Sometimes when you start with seven right away, kids are like, whoa, this is a lot. Um, but if you start with three, even when you start with one, 
you know, you might, you might sample. When I introduce the DBQ, I tell them what it is, but I also tell them how fun it is. It's like being a detective. There's an answer that they give you. And once again, the reason why I like the, the doing sequencing this way is that I've already taught them how to do an LEQ where they have to come up with all the information. But in a DBQ, the information's there. And they've been working on the multiple choice skills of breaking down a document, understanding a document. Now the, the, the information's there and they just are able to pull information uh, from the document and see if they can pull, pull an argument from it. So oftentimes I'll ask the kids and I'll tell the kids, if you have three documents and they're entirely different, um, make sure that um, make sure that you um, in those documents are able to you know pull an argument from each one, and then once you pull an argument from each document, um, then you know you can you can look to start categorizing and see what arguments kind of go together, and then make your thesis statement. Um, all right, with this. Um, I got, uh, there's a couple of questions on the chat. Um, I'd love for you guys to just throw in any questions that you guys have. Um, I, I know one of the questions was about, um, it's, it's recorded. Um, these are definitely gonna be posted. Um, you're gonna get a recording uh, of this uh, webinar and then you'll be able to go through it at any time. Um, you're also gonna get um, a bunch of information, documents that we've talked about in here, lessons, sample lessons, um, template writing, um, and then uh, you know some of the some of the things that we talked about in here, the murder mysteries, some creative fun lessons that are just when you when you really is, has to take a step back, but also lessons that teach those skills Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, the last you know as as and then anytime there's questions that can come in, um, I'll stop and I'll answer them. But one of the most important things in all of this, I think, is realizing the the power of scheduling and making sure that you build in a routine for your classes. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday being skill days. They're fun days, they're skill days. Sometimes it's just, you know, hey, we're, we're working on a thesis statement today. So throw a question on the board, talk with a neighbor, brainstorm with a neighbor for five minutes, and then you are writing a thesis statement and then you're sharing it with me um, or we're putting it on the board or you're sending it in a Google Doc. And then I'm gonna look, on, look at them and then I don't have to grade a whole entire essay. I just look at a thesis statement and I get your feedback on that. But these are the skills that you have to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then, um, Thursdays are those content days and Fridays are, are the assessment days. And the one thing, again, when you schedule, you can stay on that schedule. It's like, you know, you can't, you're on an escalator in AP. You can't get off and spend a week on a two months on something. Right. Um, but, um, one of the things that, um, you gotta be able to do is, um, you have to schedule that review time at the end of the year. And if you're taking anything from this, make sure that you give yourself three weeks and make sure that you build in time to review um, because it's, it's so incredibly important. Um, and again, um, you know, just kind of showing you um, on, on, uh, on the screen right now, um, my schedule that I had used last year. Um, and this is, this is how I built in um, my reviews, right? So I made sure that I was done in April um, with my content. I finished 1900 to present. I tested on it, unit exam test on it. And then it was all skills and practice and information and um, video lectures. And, and, you know, last year, if there's any uh, great hidden blessing of all this stuff is, is it caused a lot of us to, to put some things online. And so, you know, my, my colleagues and I, we made review videos. So we have review videos for every time period, for every quiz. So, you know, on Thursday, uh, we have a, you know, online platform like Canvas. I'm going to share that with uh, my my colleagues, or I'm sorry, my, my kids, they're going to watch it. Um, you know, we can embed questions in it. We have something called Edpuzzle. Um, but these, if, if last year helped in any way, was able to digitize a lot of these things and extend our content reach um, beyond just the, the classroom walls during those class, class times. Um, so again, um, we're kind of running, running out here. But again, the most important thing I would I would suggest is that you build in time, especially at the end of the year, and 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 make sure that if you can to give the kids a full practice exam. Um, you grade the multiple choice; that's easy. The SAQs um, they can be graded pretty quickly, but you get a score back. Um, and then at the end of the year, you know you'll do the DBQs and LEQs. You put it all together, and the kids when they get that score sheet, the best realization they is they realize, wait, that's all I have to do to get a passing grade of a three. Right, and they start. They start then tackling their weaknesses, and they have them. If, if you've done a practice review two or three weeks out, 
they have two or three weeks to work on those skills and, uh, and, and make their weaknesses uh, stronger. And they won't make the mistakes they made on that practice test on the real test. Um, and that's, I think that's the hidden gem of everything we've done. It's the reason we have the pass rate that we do is uh, making sure that those kids take that practice, that final practice exam. Um, if you can see on the schedule that I have for this year, our kids are taking the practice exam. Um, they're taking it Sunday, April 24th. And our school and administration is great backing that up. So um, I feel like I can talk forever. Um, I appreciate everything. Uh, I appreciate you guys having me. And uh, hopefully you were able to take a nugget or two of information. Um, so thank you. Dave, just a few questions. Um, yep. Maybe you can answer these pretty quickly. Um, how long are your class periods? Uh, we have, uh, so we, we meet every day and we meet for 48 minutes. Okay. And we addressed the one about the documents and the recording. Those will be uh, coming. Um, someone wants to know, do you lead any trainings over the summer or during the school year? Um, I, so every year we do, um, there's an AP conference uh, around the Chicagoland area. And I presented that about three or four times. Um, I just got uh, the invite to, uh, to do week-long seminars. Um, and so I have three kids at home. So I'm, I'm kind of mixing that up and, and, I, I'm not doing a week long summit seminar yet, but I will probably in the future. Um, but I'd also be willing to, if any, I'm sharing my emails, I'd love to help out in any way I could. So, right. I mean, that's something I could put my, in the chat, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, and if anybody wants, um, my email, um, they can just email me and I'd love to get back to that. Yeah. And then, uh, the last question is, uh, you said that you had 265 freshmen taking the course. Yep. Would you do anything differently if the class is primarily made up of sophomores, juniors, or seniors? So yeah, for us, it's uh, the scaffolding is a little different. If, if a senior is taking the course, then um, the best thing about AP classes is that the AP classes build upon each other. So if you have seniors, you're able to do maybe less scaffolding and start uh, maybe in the middle um, and not necessarily have to go back and teach every skill at its beginning step. Um, and so that's something that I would do. Um, I think that's something that would be done differently. And the why would you get to the why sooner? Those ana analytical lessons, um, the debates, you can just do more with seniors um, than, uh, than with freshmen. You kind of have to have a predictable schedule it's good for them to know that every Friday you're quizzing. Um, if you have seniors, you can be a little bit more flexible with that. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest differences uh, that I think. Great, great. So uh, we're at time and I wanted to thank everyone for attending our webinar today. Be sure to visit our website at perfectionlearning.com and follow our next step blog so that you can get more blog posts from Dave. So thank you everyone for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you.